David. David Johnson is on the line, right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, David. Uh, this is Albert Bloomberg. Oh, I'm sorry. And Mech is on the line too. Good morning, Ann. Hi, this is David Johnson. Can you hear me? Hello, this is David Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes, David, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good morning and welcome. Um, Grim, I'm a rate analyst here at the HSCRC. Dion Joyce, and I'm a rate analyst. Barbara Brocato, Brocato and Associates. Michelle Mann, CFO, Frederick Regional Health Systems. Uh, Brett McCone from the Maryland Hospital Association. And Tracy Laval from the Maryland Hospital Association. Mike is um, out of town today. Ben Steffen from the Maryland Healthcare Commission uh, representing uh, Paul today, who's uh, unavailable. Kristen Goyle with Venice Healthcare. David Krasky, Mike Bridge. Sharadi Medicaid. Cynthia Flagg, United Healthcare. John Hamper, Care First. With Bob Murray representing Care First. Uh, Steve Ports, HSCRC. Should I get over to HSCRC? Donna Kenzer, HSCRC. Jerry Smith, HSCRC. Ellen Englert, HSCRC. And good morning, it's David Johnson with Sibson Consulting. Uh, this is uh, Albert Blumberg, Maryland Radiological Society. Stan Dorn from the Urban Institute, um, working with Maryland Healthcare for All. And Mac University of Maryland School of Nursing. about today is the uh, uh, revised recommendation uh, for uh, 
for the uh, three psychiatric hospitals and Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital. At the last more, uh, last meeting, uh, we uh, um, recommended an update factor of two point. I mean, one point five five percent. What we're going to do is uh, revise that recommendation. Uh, we start off with the uh, the amount that's being approved uh, for inflation for psych hospitals of 2.8. We're reducing that by the 0.75 percent for the uh, ACA adjustment that Medicare is is applying. We're not going to to apply though the other half a percent offset uh, that would pro provide the hospitals with a 2.05 percent increase uh, update for for this upcoming year. Uh, for that, okay. Uh, we have a number of recommendations here and, and, and uh, things that the hospitals, uh, we want them to do for us. Uh, you can see there's an, they, they sort of parallel the, uh, the recommendations that we made for the other acute care hospitals. This has a little bit more to do uh, with specifically to psychiatric hospitals. Uh, one of the main things that we're asking them to do is to work with us we're trying to compile a, uh, a list of potentially avoidable utilizations. And so there are other things on here. You can take a look at this. Um, again, they sort of mirror what we've asked the other hospitals to do. Donna, if you want to comment on that section of it. I think um, uh, the uh, staff is starting to work on putting in uh, performance uh, measures for the psych hospitals, uh, quality metrics, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and I think that process has started. Um, and um, um, to have uh, the uh, to have value-based purchasing uh, metrics in place for uh, the the uh, psych in Mount Washington pediatric hospitals that could start in progress uh, by uh, next summer. Um, and um, uh, also, really to focus on um, putting in case management and post-acute, uh, um, uh, you're not, not hearing me, oh, we're flipping to the overhead, putting in, putting in uh, case management and, and post-acute uh, 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 care coordination for the site patients and working with the other hospitals uh, and uh, community-based organizations to try to avoid hospitalizations um, and uh, to reduce readmissions. And, um, and, and we certainly expect to see that as part of the value-based performance measures that are put in to, uh, to monitor um, readmissions um, uh, in in uh, that in that environment in those environments. Um, so uh, and uh, and also uh, in particular for the psychiatric institutions, to but but also for the uh, 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 pediatric uh, institutions to work in with the uh, state in um, in the progression plan for the all payer model. Uh, with a particular emphasis on developing more community-based psychiatric resources that would avoid hospitalizations um, and um, really uh, focusing on the development of plans with the state um, that are, um, that are uh, targeted toward, uh, toward that effort. So that's kind of a very uh, fast and high level uh, of uh, what would be uh, required in order to to, to uh, change that update, and and it will require the psychiat psychiatric hospitals in Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital to make investments in uh, in resources in order to be able to execute on um, on those uh, recommendations. So that it would be uh, um, really contingent on. The, the institutions agreeing to those um, conditions in order to receive the extra money. So Donna, um, we fully support the additional quality measures and all, but what you just said, it's going to be conditioned on them their acceptance. So is there going to be then, you know, in order to get this 0.5, are you going to get signed, some kind of signed agreement from the hospitals that they're going to accept these and then there's going to be consequences down the road like they are? For the other policies, quality mm -hmm. policies. 
Kathy, I think that would be a good idea in order to get the, the extra money in the rate order that we would, we have a GBR amendment that we'll be talking about for the the other hospitals to have a, a special uh, uh, agreement. You know, it, it won't be a GBR agreement, but a special agreement with the, those hospitals that they're going to do the things that are outlined. So yes, I think that that's a, okay. we'll, uh, um, definitely put that on the list because if they don't want to do it, then we can just go with the lower rate update. So, you know, that's fine. Um, I mean, it's not fine because we really want people to do these things, but we yes, agree. I think we the, the, uh, the um, but yes, we'll, we'll put it in writing and have people sign it. The CEOs have been signing the agreement, so we'll ask the CEOs of these institutions to sign the agreement. Just to follow up on that, if they sign it, we'll, I assume there'll be some check at the back end. And, and if they don't do it, would there be the possibility to either pull the money out of rates or next year not be as generous? Uh, it, yeah, is that the expectation? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we have to we, we have to um, we have to see progress. So if we're going to do case management, then we have to see case managers um, in place and working with Chris. Right, and actual so. utilization decline, right. One thing we do we remind everyone is that uh, Medicare does not pay commission approved rates for psychiatric services. So they, they reimburse based on their own principles. And so this does this won't have an impact on the Medicare payments. It does have an impact on Medicaid inpatient payments, but not Medicaid outpatient payments. Medicaid does not pay the outpatient rates that the HSC or C sets. And that, that's one thing we may want to clear up with Trish. Um, we've been told that the Medicare is Medicaid is paying 90% of outpatient charges to the psychiatric facilities. Do you know whether that's correct or not? Okay. Okay. We, someone else said that they were paying like 40 some percent, and there was a settle up. At the end, the cost settle up. I don't know of that for hospitals. So. We're getting paid our current cost to charge ratio from a prior period. Um, so our cost to charge ratio from the prior period happened to be 47 percent. I don't know what Shepherd Pratt or Brooklyn's cost to charge ratio was. But that's based on. That's our interim rate for outpatient. Right. Is that does that include residential treatment patients? No, that's a separate cost settlement. Things different than what we've been told. That's what we need to find out then, what exactly is the reimbursement levels for the hospitals. So if I could make a couple comments. Um, so the first one, as you mentioned, Medicare doesn't pay the HSCRC approved rates. They pay inpatient pre-standing site PPS payments. Um, Medicare does or is developing value-based purchasing for the psychiatric facilities, so I just would want to be careful that we don't create multiple met multiple metrics to have to manage. I don't know that we would be able to get an exception from Medicare's value-based purchasing for the freestanding psychiatric or specialty hospitals because they are not covered under HSCRC rates. Um, the other concern I have is just that we, you know, if we're going to make investments in community-based mental health services, which we already are, but it is a challenge, we are to avoid utilization. We are still fee-for-service reimbursed, so having to make investments to actually reduce revenue is a challenging financial proposition um, and may not be sustainable over the long term. Um, and then the last thing is just with the data sharing with Chris. We're actually sending data to Chris, but we have significant challenges with that due to HIPAA regulations around the psychiatric population. So we're not able to get anything back. We send to them, but we're not able to get any information back from them. Yeah. Well, you should be able to get your own information back, but not other people, so. Right, but we, we have our own information internally. Yeah. So. <coughs> anyway, but. Be able to get readmission. Um, right now, we're, we've asked. We're told not at this point. Right. I know that's something that's being worked on, but um, the um, I 
I think there's a, a couple of things relative to um, psych uh, utilization and um, the uh, there is a, there's certainly a potential to have psych hospitals on global budgets, and that's always uh, something that can be pursued going forward. But also, um, it's not necessarily the, your hospital that is going to have the avoided utilization. It might be his hospital because we don't want the patients coming into the emergency room. If we can have better community-based resources, we don't want them in acute hospitals for three-day stays um, to get get uh, stabilized because they didn't get stabilized in the community. And so it might not be your utilization that we're trying to avoid. It might be his. Um, and uh, the, the issue is really helping to drive the system toward more community-based resources because there's not enough community-based resources and there may be more than adequate inpatient hospital beds, but there's certainly not uh, not adequate community-based resources from what, you know, from uh, at least from uh, what what we can uh, fathom from uh, working working our way around the, the discussion loop, uh, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's a problem. And we're supportive of that. We've developed various outpatient wellness clinics, but they are challenging because the typical payer mix in those wellness clinics is Medicaid um, or uninsured. So it's not a lot of commercial patient. Uh, population. So it's financially those outpatient wellness clinics are very challenged. And so there may be new mechanisms. So this is the strategic planning process. So it may be that you need to work with the, the planning process to help develop new mechanisms to get those things funded. And so um, uh, maybe they need to be funded better. And if they're funded better in some way, maybe we can have a more community-based resource and we won't have people trying to get new psych beds instead of getting new community-based resources. So how can we, so I think it's part of the planning challenge of how can we make sure that the funding gets directed to the right place so that we can have people stabilized in the community instead of being admitted to a hospital that doesn't actually stabilize them very long and um, coming back and coming back and coming back and not actually getting them stabilized because there's not adequate community resources. So we really want to encourage the psychiatric hospitals to, um, to escalate their participation in that planning effort so that we can, can help drive forward that thought process. So um, I'll just chime in here. This idea of um, better coordination for people with um, psychiatric illnesses and where they can be treated, it's a statewide issue. Um, and it's, there are different mental health work groups going on to try to address these issues of not having enough community-based capacity. So um, I think that that work is important and it's ongoing. And I wouldn't want to see us, I'm not sure if I'm hearing this right or not, but I wouldn't want to see us try to lay that whole issue on the footsteps of um, and on the shoulders of um, our um, specialty psych hospitals because it's too big of an issue. It's something that, that we all around this table really have to address. So um, um, I think everyone is on board with um, better management, better resources uh, for people who have um, psychiatric conditions. And, and getting people the care that they need. But I caution us on taking too narrow of a viewpoint, um, particularly when the, um, the specialty psych hospitals are really not affecting our, um, our waiver metrics. Well, yes, they are. They're in the, out, they're in the Medicare metrics. They certainly are. Um, they certainly are affecting our waiver metrics. The psych admission, every psych admission for Medicare patient is, uh, counts as a cost. and so. Even if it didn't, it would, it is, every psych admission for Medicaid counts as a cost. So every time we admit somebody who could have been taken care of in the community, it's a costly event that doesn't necessarily improve their quality of life. Sure. It's, and, a, it's in there. I didn't mean to say that it wasn't in there. But it's the same as it is in the rest of the country. It's, no, it's, it's not the same as the rest of the country. There are better psych delivery systems in some other, other parts of the country. There, there are better outpatient psychiatric delivery systems. But I don't want to take it into the discussion of the weeds 
but, uh, but I'm not but, trying to go in the weeds, but, uh, but I want to make sure that we understand. What, what, what we I think have, you interrupted me when I was well, I finishing. Is that this is a statewide issue? Of course, we need a lot of resources to address the issue, and and I really think that parts of these recommendations are trying to put the whole burden on our specialty psych hospitals, and, and we need to spread that. Well, I think everybody had in their plan to, to work on the strategic plan, and so some people said, well, we, the, that's not relevant to psych hospitals, and we're saying, well, yeah, it is, so here's how it would be relevant to the psych hospital. So it's really just to say, how is it relevant to the psych hospitals? Everybody needs to work on it. and um, and um, you know, and a, a lot of folks say exactly the same thing that Kristen said. Well, we would do community-based programs, no, but they're not. we are doing. No, no, but uh, right. But other people are saying we want beds. We want new beds because we need places for psych patients, and we would do community-based programs, but they lose money, and so that's really a that's a that's a bad answer. That we have to come up with a better answer to that um, to that uh, that response. So. Really, just saying, hey, let's we're we're in a planning phase here. Let's come up with a better answer to that uh, response. So, can I just uh, clarify one thing? When we talk about uh, being part of the um, strategic planning, what what exactly does that mean? We're in the process of doing a, a plan for the state for moving the system forward and. Um, Medicaid's working with the dual eligible. DHMH is working with the dual eligible. And right. We're so, so like the, the advisory group of, work, all of that and, work. And, I, and what you know, whatever goes behind that as put as uh, in input feed uh, input into that uh, planning process of what do we need to drive the system forward. Mm -hmm. So that's really really uh, what 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 it is, not something. Greater, right. not trying to put some undue burden on the, the psych hospitals, but really just kind of raise the raise the uh, the concern that um, if 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 we keep hearing that we need more beds because we don't have outpatient resources, um, that's really a serious problem that needs to be tackled. Yeah, I think the message is that there needs to be more resources for for, for outpatients. And, uh, I, I don't know the answer. I, I don't I don't want to presume to know the answer, but no, we I mean we definitely agree that outpatient <coughs> step down outpatient services do prevent admissions and readmissions, and that there needs to be there definitely needs to be more community resources. We are not in disagreement with that. We just have limited funds to be able to make those investments, especially when they do have um, poorer payer mixes that we can't um, drive at least a break-even margin, much less any kind of profitability to be able to reinvest. We have opened up multiple outpatient wellness clinics in our area and also in support of other hospitals in their area, and they're, they're challenging to operate. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of the process of trying to figure out how to make it less, cha how to make it less challenging um, to operate um, better outpatient resources. So hopefully that can be part of the strategic planning conversation. So that that was the the uh, main uh, issue of uh, the the point of you know getting involved in that process and being a a voice. Mm -hmm. And um, from the performance measurement point of view, Diane Feeney is leading the group to look at this, and I just want to make sure we are looking at psych patients, not psych institutions, so this will involve the acute care um, hospital psych beds to kind of try to come up with good performance measures for the psych patients. So that kind of addresses your question that here we specifically are talking about psych because the update factor there, but the work group and performance measurement is about the psych patients, regardless of which institutions they're admitted. So right now, the psychiatric patients within the general acute hospitals are included in, a, in their current performance measurements, the readmissions. I don't know that psych patients have a lot of MHACs, or, but they probably have some lies. Um, are we saying that we would separate that out from the metric and have a, a 
psychiatric specific set of metrics versus? So um, I, the performance work group is going through some uh, discussions around the strategic planning for um, changing our payment methodologies. There is a white paper call out. I was going to mention that at the end, but this might be a good place. Um, so we are asking for input to look at our program overall in general and strategically um, think about the next step in whether combining or breaking some of the measures and focus more service lines and patient oriented. Mm -hmm. um, for the psych, yes, they are included in the readmission, but as you know, there are other quality measures like waste trains and other things that are specific to that population that we don't measure or include. Um, so this is an attempt to look at them and then see if there are other measures that we want to have for specifically for psych patients. And we may break the readmission rate and then measure it separately for psych patients versus others. Um, the, the, the same with the pediatric population, a lot of our measures exclude them. So uh, kind of looking at overall to try to go underneath our measures and try to think about whether certain populations, certain patients are uh, in need of different measures and, and, and separate uh, programs. So just one comment here. Um, um, I would just caution us as we look at any kind of metrics that whatever quality metrics we use, that we use vetted metrics. Um, because when we, if we were to use metrics that haven't been vetted by a national organization, we can end up with unintended uh, measurement bias. So, I mean, the people measuring readmissions right. in a, at leave for a site separately is fine. Um, but if we, I wouldn't want us to make up measures. We never make up measures, I don't think. <laughs> uh, the PQI, I, PQI, 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 ARC, and uh, NQF. But they are, but only used as a population, and we're using so that's them not, as a That's not true. They are, used as, they are used as myths for physicians as a provider-based payment adjustments now. They're, they're used in almost every bundled payment venue. They're used uh, in uh, Prometheus. They're used in uh, 3M. Uh, 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 with a and, population. No, no, not with a population. They're used as avoidable utilization with, uh, with all of the Prometheus bundled payment models, with all of the 3M avoidable admissions payments model they're used. So, so they may be but used, that, but ARC what, doesn't recommend that. Well, the, ARC, uh, ARC actually says they shouldn't so, be used for that. So we'll, uh, we'll take that up in another venue. Okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, we agree with you. Um, that's why we're bringing experts and the uh, providers in the site especially to get more feedback into what measures are available and what measures are used. And I think Kristen's points on the Medicare value-based purchasing is a good one. We need to make sure we align our payment there. Um, uh, but we are looking at the anchor of validated measures. Um, and I don't think we are going to go beyond what is available out there. We don't have expertise to develop our own measures. Yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of weigh in. I, I'm not aware of you know, state agencies getting involved in measure development. I think we're using uh, across the board, to my knowledge, uh, we're using uh, recognized measures, and it's, it's a tricky business to get involved in, in development uh, from a state perspective, uh, because many of our, of our uh, carriers and uh, institutions are uh, serving cross-population organizations as well. I think the question you raise about application uh, is, is a question that probably needs to be discussed you know, elsewhere, but you know, certainly uh, organizations within the state uh, and elsewhere are looking at how these measures be uh, applied more specifically and it's a, you know, worth the worth discussion but not sure this is the right place to do it. The only thing I'll um, say is, um, you know, in our meetings with CMMI, um, they are looking for us to be uh, uh, developing new metrics. Um, and testing different things, um, and they've specifically told us that. So um, with regards to the hospitals, that might be different, but in terms of where we're going with dual eligibles and population health, they are pushing, and they've said directly that they're looking for us to test different metrics. Um, I, 
maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm looking at this too simplistically, but it looks to me like um, this is a pretty simple issue of uh, HSCRC deciding to put some money back in the rates um, in order to um, target particular efforts, and um, most of these elements say work with. So um, there's not an indication that HSCRC is intending to imp uh, impose. Um, any kind of measures or any other kind of requirements without collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, institutions that are involved and um, targeting efforts at these specific things as a substitute for a downward adjustment for productivity seems to me to be a very good idea um, because um, taking money out of the system and then saying, well, you just have to be more productive um, is, is probably not appropriate in this environment. So putting that money back in the system and saying here's what we think increase in productivity means um, seems to me to be pretty appropriate. And everything else, the specifics, it seems to me are, uh, you know, will be developed in collaboration with the uh, hospital industry and everybody else. So, uh, I mean, if I'm reading that right, that I'm very comfortable with that. So just to, to put things in from a scale perspective, the psychiatric revenues in the state are what, less than $200 million in HSCRC regulated revenues, of which 30% of that is Medicare. So that piece doesn't get updated by this. So half a percent on that revenue base doesn't, I mean, it's, it's not a lot of money to make investment in, in other programs. Right. It won't take care of the community-based psych right. investment. And, and so this is, you know, it's not going to get you a lot of case management either. So it's uh, so that's that's absolutely true, and things need to be done beyond this. But um, um, the volumes are still paid out at 100% variable, and um, and and so that's you know so it's a there there needs to be some uh, uh, productivity approach that uh, recognizes that. And this is, and like you said, this is the. We're trying to make the system more productive from a per capita basis by avoiding hospitalizations at not at your hospital but at Northwest. Um, since uh, David's not paying attention, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the concept 20 minutes ago. Right. So also, uh, I, if I can um, make a suggestion, um, because I know Medicare is always a problem with this kind of thing. Um, I know that CMMI has done a lot of talking, at least, about um, focusing on um, determinants of healthcare utilization, especially for specific populations that go beyond the healthcare delivery system. Um, and uh, we might want to kind of hook up with some of the things that they're doing to try to get some leverage, because I know we can't uh, negotiate a different deal for psych hospitals in Maryland than everybody else gets. Out a big involved process, but we might be able to um, hook up with some of the things they, they're trying to develop that go beyond the healthcare delivery system and try to get some of these community-based resources in place. Because I know hospitals can't partner with community partners if there aren't any community partners being supported by any funding from anybody. Was that a volunteer to help? <laughs> Any comments from the webinar? Move on, all right. Where's the clicker? Clicker, it's underneath. The, um, I think um, when we uh, when we last left the meeting here, um, uh, we uh, had a, uh, a draft recommendation in hand at the uh, commission meeting. Uh, we uh, the the commission staff. Uh, uh, recommended an additional update. Um, an additional amount of inflation. We, we had uh, recommended holding back the uh, 
correction factor from the last, uh, estimate based on the last couple of years. Um, but at the commission meeting, we recommended um, allowing um, that 0.56 to come into rates, but only in the second half of the year and only under certain conditions. And, um, and um, I think we were just, uh, with the psych hospitals here, we were looking at, um, at some of those uh, conditions um, that hospitals would need to agree to in order to, um, to get that money in the second half of the year. Um, and um, uh, I think we sent out the, uh, a, a draft uh, list of um, a draft of the requirements and a little bit more explanation about what was in the, uh, in the update recommendation. And, um, and we want to uh, see if there are uh, comments on, on the list or questions about the list um, as we uh, uh, you know, move it toward uh, uh, being incorporated into a GBR contract amendment. Um, and um, I think also, in addition to uh, in, in addition to those requirements, um, we also uh, um, you know want to note that the and noted in the recommendation that the commission would be closely monitoring uh, Medicare performance uh, targets, including the uh, total cost of care growth. And, um, and noting that, that um, the commission has the authority to adjust rates um, if uh, we're not, uh, if, if we have uh, concerns about where we are in terms of, uh, of uh, performance of the system from a cost standpoint uh, or from a quality standpoint, et cetera. So that uh, we, we did recommend that the commission increase its performance measurement and reporting in the public, and uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today, um, and and also just express the concern that if um, if uh, if the uh, money that we put into the rates after the first of the year um, caused the cost to go up too much in 17, um, that that would uh, end up causing a problem with the the 17 update, and so um, uh, just uh, kind of in recognition that um, uh, the, in general, the issue is that the Medicare rate updates are very low, and the utilization in Maryland did not fall, uh, Medicare utilization in Maryland did not uh, fall uh, enough in 15 to, um, to, uh, to really cover those, um, may not have fallen enough in 15 to cover those rates, but definitely did not fall enough to uh, cover the cost that popped up in the non-hospital side. And so, uh, and we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about that, but um, it is a real and uh, ongoing concern that we um, are going to focus on creating some uh, uh, better uh, insight to on a monthly basis. Um, um, but that, that's uh, what this uh, this uh, draft for discussion revised recommendations um, is is all about. And um, I guess I would like to ask if there are any questions or comments on it. I think some of the hospitals have already seen it through. Uh, the Maryland Hospital Association. We sent it out to the Hospital Association uh, earlier. Do we have any questions so, or comments? Just um, one comment um, to start with at the risk of being too, um, too in the weeds, but I think it's important to say is on the, the second page, the, um, the box at the bottom right, um, when we're talking about reducing potentially avoidable utilization, not a problem with the concept, but um, also in the, the uh, words that say also include all medical admissions through the ER. Um, if we're starting to, I, I don't want us to think that all medical admissions through the ER 
are potentially avoidable utilization and we somehow have an incentive to reduce all medical admissions through the ER. Um, some certainly could be reduced, but, but those are, are include groups of patients who need to be seen to save their lives. Everybody coming through the ER who's admitted needs to be seen to save their life or to give them needed medical care. So uh, there is nobody here that is saying that, that once somebody gets to the hospital that they need to go into the hospital. I, we're not trying to say that. We're just saying that uh, the community-based interventions to improve um, to improve the, uh, the patient's condition in the community can avoid medical admissions and through the ER. Um, and so that's really what, what it's all about is focusing on uh, selecting um, uh, uh, complex and, and high needs patients and trying to get them better community-based care and measuring the success. And, and so really what we, need to, we, what we need to turn the conversation to hopefully is measuring what does success look like and the, one of the areas what does success look like? It looks like we're getting fewer patients coming into the ER because we didn't, uh, because we gave them better community-based care. We're never going to uh, reduce it, uh, medical admissions through the ER to zero, but we can certainly decrease medical admissions through the ER if we have enhanced community-based care. So that's really saying don't, as you're thinking about your targets for your institutions, and I, you know, I know that you all have ACOs. I'm sure that those of you who have ACOs are looking at medical admissions through the ER as a target and not just some tiny section of the medical population. So this is to encourage you to look at it, look at the whole group of, 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 of patients that, that if you had better complex and better chronic care that these patients might not end up in the hospital. So that's what what that's a, that, that's about, and uh, not 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 uh, not getting hung up at the level of of some subset of the population, but of looking at your high needs and high uh, complex patients and saying what can we do to help keep these patients stable and in better condition in the community so they do not end up in the hospital. Don, that's what that's all that. about. <clears throat> the fact. I just want to understand when we say all medical admissions because the model, at least at Frederick, is that they are not direct admits like at some places. So everyone goes through the ED so that they get immediate triage for their needs, which if they went directly to the floor, they might not get. So that model of, of management has changed over the years. Uh, and care managers are in the ED to do just the work for the chronics. That are coming in, and so when we say it's too late all, if they're in the ED. Hmm? I said it's too late if they're getting their chronic care well, in the I ED. I understand, <laughs> but they're not. You know, we know that. So, um, but my point is, why are we including all medical admissions? I, I think when the, the, the standard the, is that every medical the, admission comes in through the ED. The, the, the point is, the point is that we need to have targets, and so that's uh, you know part of the ongoing discussion. We need to have targets for the state <clears> to say. What would success look like if we were doing a good job of better chronic care? What would success look like in terms of reduced medical admissions, for example? That would be, if you're having an ACO, you're going to say, what would success look like if we were doing a good job with our ACO? And so now we have the ACO is the state. We have this, a state that has a, a capitated program for hospital costs. So as a state, what we're going to drive the conversation forward is what would success look like if we were actually doing a good job of better community-based care? Uh, what what would success look like? What would what would our admissions look like in the state? What would they look like in Frederick County? What would they look like in Baltimore City? And so we need to drive that conversation forward of what does success look like so that we can move away from thinking about how do we avoid failure to how do we actually succeed, what does it look like, and set targets that are based on what does success look like for our patients 
and them not ending up in the emergency room with an escalating condition. And so that's really the point of the conversation is really having, uh, working with the industry to set targets of what would success look like. Okay, so clarify for me this measure. Is that going to be used in the current way we look at PAU? So now the PAU definition is adding the medical admits to the ED, or are we doing kind of a record keeping uh, analysis to, to see what's possible? Um, I'm just, I, I just wanted to understand. I think, I think we, we need, uh, if we're going to succeed in our all payer model, we need to move to aspirational targets. So what will we aspire to if we were trying to produce better patient care? What would we be aspiring to achieve? And how would we measure success in terms of our utilization? And, and, and so I think trying to move away from uh, a, a thought process of, hey, did we just get over the line on some metric that Medicare put out there that is the minimum performance standard to what would it look like if we were actually, um, how much, what, what do we need to do in terms of getting avoidable utilization down that would be a, a, a recognition that we're um, aspirationally doing better for our patients and we're uh, keeping people from having to come to the emergency room or as an inpatient. So. Uh, getting into a target setting instead of a reactionary mode of what is your target? What is your aspirational target for your county or your service area in terms of, of where you should be if you're actually succeeding in providing better community-based care and how are you going to get there? And so trying to get into that mode because we didn't have uh, very good utilization performance last year, and so we need to get into more of an aspirational approach with it. Yeah. Uh, this is this is Stan Dorn, and I just wanted to uh, voice my support for this general approach, which seems to make a lot of sense. You know, the idea of, of giving hospitals additional resources, but contingent on um, improving uh, reductions in in the PAU, including. PQI, I think it makes a lot of sense. What's going to be an interesting challenge is to figure out um, how we do, how we cal calculate, calibrate individual hospital accountability for meeting what are really population-based targets. You know, for Frederick County, for Baltimore City, whatever the geographic area is, um, it's going to be, it's going to require a contribution from from multiple hospitals to achieve those goals. So we, we're, we're, I think it's going to be an interesting challenge, but I think it's, it's a really important one, and I just wanted to, to commend you and your colleagues, Donna, for this approach. So I'll jump in here, Stan. I'm so glad you said that. You said it much better than, than I could have, because I think that's where the gulf is between, um, between our comments, is that it makes sense to track um, ED admissions um, it makes sense to look at PQIs, but what's different about our Maryland system than an ACO or some other uh, uh, captive group of, of covered lives is that we don't really know yet how to um, attribute people to individual hospitals, so we don't know what that denominator is, and people can move between hospitals, so we don't know whether um, the reductions that we're seeing in one place are the result of that hospital's uh, activities, the result of another hospital's activities, or whether patients have just shifted. Um, and we have the, it, it completely makes sense to track this, and I think that's where Michelle was going with the, asking the question of, are we just looking at this, or are we making this a new metric, and, and this is what I meant by developing new metrics. Um, that, that we hold hospitals accountable for in terms of adjusting payments. And I think that when we get to that last part about adjusting payments and saying we expect everyone to have this reduction, that's, that's where it gets concerning. In, in your waiver application um, that you all signed off on, that you're bound to, it says that you're going to um, uh, develop uh, programs uh, to reduce 
unavoidable utilization, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and we need to start um, getting serious about measuring that. And uh, because if we uh, and, and uh, we'll work with you to develop the measures and how to distribute them. But we need to have aspirational targets. Otherwise, everybody in this room is going to face rate reductions um, if, they, if we don't get avoidable utilization down. And, and what we really want is better care. And we have to put in the infrastructure to deliver the better care. But we're not going to get there if we uh, don't have aspirational targets, and so uh, I, we're we're saying we need more aspirational targets, and um, and and we need the industry working with us to develop those aspirational targets that are actually going to make the model work and that are going to show that we actually delivered better care to the patients in Maryland. And so we need we need. MHA and every hospital and every consumer group and every payer working with us to develop aspirational targets of what would it look like, what would our utilization look like if we were delivering better community-based care and better chronic care and better complex care, what would it look like and how are we going to get there and over what time frame. And, um, and that's what we should be measuring as a success measure um, as opposed to uh, just whether we got to a certain point on a line for a Medicare test for the year. We need to have more aspirational targets. And so that's what, that's what we're, uh, we're saying. And if we don't have those, if, if hospitals aren't trying to reduce avoidable utilization and they're sitting on their current level of utilization, then we're not going to reach our goals of delivering better care. Donna, could I just say Can I a little bit down the rabbit hole, so please excuse me for a second. But um, <clears throat> I like everything you're saying, and I totally agree. So this is not about um, trying to argue. It's just I want to add a layer onto this. So I was interested in looking at our service line admissions by age. So 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 12, et cetera, up until the uh, 90 and above. And I think this might be something to look at from a state level, because I think that would help direct the conversation a bit. This, this is, is Ann Mesh. Can, Ann, can I just finish a second? I'm sorry. Um, now, what was interesting about the data is out of the total medical admissions, now it's just medical admissions, in the um, probably the 10 and above, up until you hit about 50 years old, psych that is the main driver, if you look at a percentage to total med, it's, it's in your psych service line. Once you hit about 50 years old, it just dropped, it's gone. Where did it go? So it's up, now psych becomes secondary to COPD and the congestive heart failure and all the chronics. And I found, I, I mean, it literally just dropped off. And I, I think that's interesting. So what I have to do still is go back, and I haven't had a chance to yet do this, but look, did psych move to a secondary diagnosis or not? And I think this comes back around to the psych infrastructure, and I just want to be cautious that as we try to, um, those kinds of infrastructures take a little bit of time to build, and I agree that the literature will tell you that psych is better dealt with on an outpatient than an inpatient, so we're not about trying to build beds. But I found that trend to be a very interesting trend, and I think if we looked at it at a high level, I wonder if we'd see the same thing that, as what we saw out at my hospital. So just a thought. Thanks. Okay, and, and, and Mac, okay. um, I have just a comment on, on, on both in terms of the community resources. The hospitals are not siloed and walled off from one another, nor are they walled off from the community resources. And I think while, while we're, we're talking about comparing one hospital to another or not being you know, penalized for how one hospital does when another hospital may be super efficient, in a community, they're all dealing with the same community resources, and perhaps it's a, uh, an opportunity for everyone to work together in terms of looking at where there's resources and gaps in resources and other things that they can take advantage of in the community because we're not isolated from the community and everybody's sharing those community resources, whether it's for medical care or whether it's for site care. And quickly it will become apparent where care management needs to really go and, and, and take, take hold in terms of community resources um, that are not necessarily solely dependent on what the hospital has or doesn't have. Well, hi, this is Mike Curran. Um, 
I think it's a fascinating conversation uh, uh, to listen to for a while. So as everybody in the room knows, we're, we are absolutely big believers in taking risk and being in the ACOs and, and participating. Um, and I, the comments about where we need to be are absolutely very appropriate. And I, I think what I'm hearing is everybody actually agrees with the idea that, yes, there needs to be uh, targets. I think the question really is one of, of pace and resources necessary to invest to, to get to those targets. Uh, and maybe for, for our industry, I, I will tell you there's there's a concern when it's worded this way that we're going to be penalized in the second six months of the year for things that actually are going to take years to develop. So maybe it's just a terminology. If, if you're suggesting that we just need to know where we're going and we need to understand what that glide path is so that we get you guys on that glide path, I think that's a conversation that the industry would be happy. And again, I don't want to speak for the industry, would be happy to do. But if it's we need to know by January this year that you're on that glide path, if not, if we're going to hold your money, I think that's a different conversation. I think you get a different reaction from the industry. And this is and this is coming from somebody who is a huge, uh, huge believer. Uh, second comment is, again, obviously, we believe in the long-term value of, of ACOs and other risk-based products uh, to do it or we wouldn't be investing the money that we are in that. Uh, with that said, uh, the track record so far of ACOs is mixed at best. Uh, a, a lot of folks have exited the ACO world because they couldn't figure out how to do this. And many of my colleagues across the country have talked about the investment of resources necessary. They're just still too far ahead of the curve in order to do that. And again, every region is different. Uh, across the country. I think we're uniquely positioned here uh, in Maryland to actually advance this ball. Uh, uh, the question really is pace, collaboration, and resources that we'll all have to invest uh, to get there. So again, I don't want to speak for the industry. I can speak for MedStar that while I agree conceptually that we need to be there and your points are taken, we have these metrics. The time period to get there and the resources to invest are not small. And it is something, uh, as the CFO and Chief Administrative Officer, I stay up at night worrying about. The investments are large, and I don't see the returns. And um, I hope we're all right. Uh, but it does keep me up at night, because we're not seeing the returns as of today. I think we, so, so you, you agree that we need to have the aspirational metrics out in front so that people can see where they need to head, and we can, we can see if we're getting there, and we, we're, we're not. We're not looking at those right now. What we are looking at is that we didn't have. Uh, we had uh, not very much of a decline in utilization last year for Medicare. We actually had an increase, and so it's putting stress on the system. Mm -hmm. And the issue is, how do we get the aspirational targets in front of us, and how do we get there uh, faster? Um, and, tied, uh, tied to an understanding tied. that we're working collaboratively together, all of us to get there, but there's not going to be a big stick that hits the hospital industry starting on January 1st. Um, now, Donna, you have every right in, and as the people in this room to, to call the question and say how, you know, are you being true to the process? And, and I think that's the, the part that we all collectively need to work together to know that we're trying. I think what you're hearing from many of my colleagues across the room is we're trying, and we're trying to understand. I mean, Michelle just went through a level of detail where she personally is trying to understand her business, uh, that's that's pretty darn impressive. Hopefully folks in the room realize that for her to have that type of knowledge base means she's invested in, in making things better uh, in this state. Again, I think the concern for the industry would be a, a hit to our rates or a not giving us the money we need to do this at a time where we believe that we are in the spirit of collaboration to get there. And, and by the way, I know from some of the funding you have of some of our special grants that there, there is that spirit of collaboration. I just wouldn't want to mess it up by a, a reduction in, in rates that we're all counting on in our, our industry because we didn't hit a target in the first six months. So a long-term view, aspirational view, I, I would be supportive of. But I don't speak for the industry. I think um, everybody wants the uh, the the uh, commission staff is certainly at the front of the line of, of folks who are interested in improved patient care and the Medicaid and the whole the whole state really wants to see the care improvement in the state and um, 
Um, and, and and we have been at it almost, for almost three years, so it's not it's not just six months out of the box. It's almost three years out of the box by January. So that's a but um but we are we are under pressure in the Medicare side, and so that's one of the things that we wanted to just look through. Um and um and uh, and we're going to try to focus on putting more information out in the public commission meetings and uh, uh, so that the, um, the that, that it can be in the public domain of what we're thinking about uh, uh, the Medicare side of the equation as well and in and, and terms of the, the speed process and uh, um, and so I think uh, this is this is Stan Dorn again. I wonder whether it makes sense to think about um, not just the aspirational goals, um, but also what what are the kinds of hospital investments that we think would achieve those goals, uh, and then those two things together uh, might make it possible to to think about accountability mechanisms through which. You know, when the goals are achieved, the gains are shared among hospitals in proportion to their contribution towards achieving those goals. And to the extent the goals aren't achieved, then the consequences also are focused on those hospitals that didn't participate. So in other words, as a way to, to benchmark that collaborative process that, that, that several people have talked about, whether it makes sense to think about not just you know, the targets, but also what might be some strategies that would help achieve those targets, some, some levels of community investment and types of investment that may be effective. Uh, this is Barbara Brocato, for those that are not here, but just sitting and listening to the discussion. I mean, I feel like everybody has the same goal, and it is about the collaboration, the care coordination. And when I look at this recommendation, I think, well, this is a good recommendation. But having worked, for instance, with emergency physicians for 25 years, and I know they have ideas and contributions, and I know a big challenge they have is what's available in the community. And so, as we look at this, and I'm, you know, I think behind behind that, like, you know, appropriate level of care, having the community resources is, you know, is is essential and fundamental to all of these recommendations in, in terms of where the state of Maryland wants to be going. So I just am, you know, emphasizing again that, you know, as we look at measures and maybe we're looking at, I don't know how much information even we have about where, you know, where the emergency room visits are under, you know, in the last two years. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know even with just numbers what may be reducing or increasing those visits, but certainly, you know, availability, care in the community is, is essential. And, and I know from working with emergency physicians and the other specialties that the physicians are um, chomping at the bit really to contribute working with the hospitals in coming up with plans and the community and the commission. So just wanted to take, take a moment. Thank you. Hi, and this is Cynthia Flagg from United Healthcare, and we're trying to work with those emergency room physicians to give them the data on what they're doing um, through value-based contracting with them. You contract with them, and we are reaching out to those emergency room physicians and basing their increases from a payer based on value-based measures. So we're trying to contribute in that way, so working with the physicians. And a lot of these physicians, these emergency room physicians, are being bought up by national companies. And that's a problem because, you know, it, it's harder and harder for a payer to, you know, negotiate these kinds of contracts when you have very mega, mega group ER groups. So it's, it's, it's a, something that we're going to have to work on together because Absolutely. you contract with them and we're trying to change their behavior as well. Oh. I think, you know, consolidation is just a big part of everything and I think, you know, hopefully from the top down in the large groups there can be that understanding and effort. So it's great that, you know, that the dialogue is underway. To the, to the comment about the strategies to reach the goals, I think on page C3 we kind of started that since the beginning of the program, you know, trying to address the high needs population and look at the rising risk population, this, this is kind of on paper what has been discussed 
so far in the last three years and try to get some measurements in terms of what are we doing in that targeted population that we talked about since the beginning of the model. Um, so I, Chris um, Russ jo joined us uh, half an hour ago, so he's going to come and talk about what they are doing from the data perspective. Uh, but what, what you're seeing here is for us to define them uniformly, which we define them as three admissions in patient and observations. And then when you look at that data to that hospital accountability, 50% of these people who have three or more are using one single hospital. So even if, even if we start there, it's complex things to think about the collaboration, but 50% is a big number. It is a good place to start. So I think we are in this a mindset that we want the perfection, we want all the answers solved before we get into it, but I think incrementally using what Chris did and getting these numbers, service line, I think Michelle did a great job in explaining that story. There are already out there that uh, what we are trying to do is what do we need, next step, and what is our long-term goal, and start getting some measurement to help us to think where we are and what, where we need to go. This is Stan. I think that's terrific. So the initial, the initial measures would say let's make sure that the people, that 50% of the, the, the high utilizers who come back to the hospital, let's make sure that we reduce um, PAU in that population as an initial step and use that as the accountability metric and then, you know, uh, think about more community-based metrics for the other 50%. Makes total sense, Julie. Were we going to go on with, uh, did you want to go with Chris next, or are there more comments on this? Oh, there, there was one other aspect of this document um, that at the end of the document um, is some language about certified electronic health record technology. And um, we want to add something to your GBR contracts to require you to do what it says here and we want you to read this and get back to us and let us know if that's any issue. And the reason that we want to put this in your GBR contract is um, that as we move forward, we will have the opportunity to attach physicians to the all-payer model and in value-based arrangements and when we do that, um, uh, the in order to be an a, a uh, an advanced payment model under macra uh, you have to meet the um, certified electronic health record technology requirements and so we would like to incorporate this language in your contract that which comes straight out of the macro regulations um, to um, ensure that when we get to the point of going to CMS and saying, hey, we've attached some docs to the contract, that, um, that we would be able to check the box on the, this requirement. So basically, this particular requirement relates to the hospital. And um, we think that all of the hospitals in the state should be um, uh, doing this. So uh, we're... Uh, thinking that this is a no-brainer, but we are counting on you to let us know. Um, I just want to make sure I'm reading it. When I, when I see care redesign participants, are, are you looking at hospital and own practices, or are you looking at AC? What, what's the design? Right, right now, right now, we just have a hospital. Um, we have a hospital advanced payment model. You know, it's a global budget, it's an advanced payment model. Um, so as we move forward, um, we've been working on a care redesign amendment, but we also have phase two coming along. As we move forward and we start joining more with physicians in collaborative efforts to uh, of care redesign, um, uh, the, then we want the hospital model to have this requirement. So right now this requirement is about the hospital, but as you add physician participants, the physician participants in the future, so this, this, right now we're just trying to apply this requirement to the hospital, not to physicians. 
in the future. And so in order to be a qualified model based on the hospital global budget, we have to have this uh, certified electronic health record technology in place. I think all of you are there. And, and so basically um, your contract would need to say the things here like you're not knowingly, willingly restricting interoperability, uh, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So you're not, you know, that's basically, uh, in order to qualify as an advanced payment model, we want to put this in your GBR contract. So, uh, I just want to make sure that you're aware, these requirements uh, for a certified electronic health record, I, I do think that everybody is probably on track for that. There are new requirements out. Um, coming out. We, I mean, there's significant costs in that. Our vendors do not do those updates for free because they're a regulatory requirement. We do have pretty hefty costs, and I'm sure everybody is trying to work with their vendors to minimize that cost. I just want to make you aware that that's not something that comes easy or free, or even at a low cost to us. Well, the uh, federal government is requiring it as uh, a measure to be an alternative payment model. So we're and pretty sure that some we of the wanna... vendors are capitalizing on that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's an important point because to, to, they just to go down another rabbit hole on this, they've changed their business models. That in order to be certified, essentially what they're doing is they're charging you per sort of per click or per piece of information passed through the system. So hospitals and health systems are being forced on these contracts where they're essentially paying for more data usage, if you will, in order to maintain that certification. So it's kind of a self, you know, perpetualizing issue of cost and, and payment in this, um, just to make folks aware of that. So if you'll get back to us if there's any problems with that language, because we're intending to put it into the supplemental GBR so we can get the APM qualification, try to get the APM qualification. Yes. Um, I, on that score, I wonder if there's anything we can do to kind of facilitate the market for... Sounds like you're volunteering for more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, in the interest of sharing information in open markets, we might, um, and certainly there, it's in the interest of hospitals to share information about mm -hmm. what vendors are more or less reasonable or what vendors are more or less high quality in achieving what they're charging us for. And, and Brett's right. You know, a lot of the, the contract models used to be based on a volume basis of beds or patient encounters, and they are now moving to bits and bytes flowing through the system. So as we want to use data more to make these improvements, we're having to pay more for that. And there's no alternative because they're the ones who certify that the record, that, that, that they're actually certified. But when you say they, that means that they compete against each other. It, it's, uh, it's, it's probably fair. You know, the the probably problem is... competing of two. I, 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 maybe oh, say. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Once leave, another one's leaving the industry. It's, it's so. kind of like a computer printer. Once you bought the daggone thing, you have to use their cartridges, and so you're kind of uh, at the mercy of the uh, printer company. Um, so I think it's uh, <laughs> yeah. except except in the case of the printer, they charge lower for the printer up front, and that's not true with the EMR vendors. So they charge you a lot for the install, and they charge you a lot for the update. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, if I could just you know I think. This is a reasonable requirement, but I think the idea that uh, most certainly the systems are well on the way to uh, the idea that you would change vendors uh, absent a catastrophic failure is probably unreasonable uh, at this point. The, the market, especially for hospital-based EHRs, has pretty much, I think, sorted itself out. But I think the state can be pay it. You know, the the CHER requirements are you can really translate them, uh, it's simplified to send, receive, uh, send, receive, use, and, and find uh, information. Uh, and the state can be um, on that latter area of uh, receiving, sending and receiving uh, 
interoperably across systems, something we need to pay attention to. You know, Chris plays a key role there, but uh, the interoperability is where EHR systems have typically fallen down in the past, and information hiding is something the federal government's been paying attention to, but there are things that states um, can do as well that we're looking into as well. Um, so, do we want to hear from Chris now, or should we look at the Medicare benchmarks first? Why don't we do it that one first, and then we back okay. to this one, and then talk about the aspiration goals. Okay. Yep. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, you have these slides. Uh, in front of you in a, in a handout, I believe, but also we're going to, there, there they are, great. Um, my name is Ross Martin. I'm the Program Director of the Integrated Care Network. I've met many of you, but not all of you. Um, so thanks for this opportunity. Let me just start by saying um, I'm not in the, ex the expert in the room. Well, I guess uh, the experts are not in the room. Let me put it that way. Craig Bem and Mary Pohl were asked to do this presentation. We're both unavailable. Um, and so they asked me yesterday if I could fill in for them. I'm certainly overseeing their work. But, but they're coming back next month to give you a much deeper dive on, on some of these aspects. So my job here is to kind of present to you where we are with CRISP reporting services and especially some of the new, uh, new tools that we're putting out to support exactly the conversation that you were just having around uh, measuring success and, and uh, affecting care coordination. So if I can have the next slide, please. And I just want to put this in the context of, again, what CRISP is for Maryland as a state designated health information exchange. We have three core services that we provide. The clinical query portal that is in widespread use uh, to provide information, clinical information at the point of care. Um, that is uh, a central part of what we do. The encounter notification service that uh, alerts providers of admissions, discharges, and transfers in hospitals and other settings, uh, but primarily hospitals. Uh, for both Maryland, D.C., and we also share data with Delaware. And then CRISP reporting services, which, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And this is uh, the tools that support both patient ident identification, care coordination, performance measurement. Um, the, the, as you think about what we built on, to, on top of the, um, the original core services for the integrated care network activities, that really is what we're focusing on right now in terms of our, of our, new, uh, of our new reports. Um, so what, you're, what a lot of your financial folks are used to doing is going into the portal, which is sort of flat files. This, this replaced an email exchange of, of these data reports that we've been, uh, that we set this portal up for over the last three years that includes patient level data at your um, hospital level, and uh, these are certainly still uh, very much what, what we are about and are continuing to work with HSCRC on producing those reports for you. Um, but what I'm going to really focus on are the, the things on the right-hand side, the Tableau-based um, dashboard that we're creating that are more focused on, uh, if you go to the next slide, on three, three core topics of high-risk patient identification, coordinating uh, care at the regional uh, level and, and planning for the coordinating that care and then also again performance measurement. On the next slide, uh, and I'm going through these quickly, if there's anything that you want to stop me about that's, that's very fine, but I know you've got a lot on your agenda so I wanted to go um, and give you this broad overview uh, quickly and then uh, just drill down if you have more questions. The PATH, the patient total hospitalization report, uh, was released earlier this year, and uh, almost all of you have now have someone in your hospitals who have been trained on this and have received credentials. I'll just remind you that, that in order to use this report, individuals have to be credentialed because it is only for the purposes of care coordination and, uh, uh, and uh, for, for using it for care and care coordination. So um, this gives you hospital information, not just from your own hospital, but across the enterprise, across the, the region, uh, based on case mix data, telling you, in this instance, in the, in the slide that you have before you, this is showing the number of patients um, in the bars who have had zero, um, or zero to, or I guess one or to many, uh, up to 10 or more uh, admissions during the time period. And because it's a Tableau uh, report, these are 
are very sophisticated reports that you can do a lot of filtering on based on diagnosis, based on area, based on age, uh, payer, all sorts of things that you can drill down and, and look at more specifics so that if you're, if you're trying to tweak the dials on a particular thing, you can, you can look at the numbers in that way. And it, and it gives you quite a bit of information. The training is extremely important on this because this is one of those rabbit hole kind of reports you can go very deep on. And, and uh, in the next slide, it shows an example of that where once you get down to looking at something at a, at a patient-specific level, you can see all those little circles in the upper left represent individual patients. Um, and in this instance, uh, compares the charges for those patients and the number of admissions for those patients. So somebody who's seen a lot of, has a lot of admissions, but uh, a small dollar amount is probably somebody who frequents the emergency department frequently. Um, and then someone who's got very high charges and few admissions is probably a, a, a long-term admissions with a, with a very serious illness. When you, when you, circle, when you grab those circles and, and look at them, you'll, you'll get very specific information in the, next or in the next little box below that shows medical record number level, individual patient level information about, those, about that person. And then graphically at the bottom, you see those little circles, colored circles and squares that represents emergency department visits for your hospital in one color and admissions in, in, in one color. And then the other colors are hospitals outside of you. So um, you can take a look at this and understand much beyond, oh, in our view, this wasn't a high utilizer because they were only seen in our emergency department a couple of times. But when I see what's happening in the other hospitals, I know there are much more complicated patients than that and they're, seeing, they're being seen in multiple places. And then you can look on the right-hand side there with the, with the very, uh, that's, that's charge level detail about individual patients with their diagnoses. You can drill down quite a lot on, on those folks. If I can comment. Um, so I'm a member of the reporting advisory committee for Chris together with uh, um, a lot of hospital reps, uh, ambulatory and, and Chris. So I, initially this report, the PATH report, kind of wanted to give two views. So anyone who's looking at their data this way, we pulled all the data, so you don't have only your hospital, but everybody else. So at the higher level, prog programmatically, they have chronic condition filters, mental health filters, to get the sense of what is going on with the population that I'm serving and look at the utilization beyond my, uh, my hospital. And then the, the report linked with the individual level hospital information. So if you are looking at that, then you can really go down and from the care coordination perspective, identify who those people are based on um, the target that you're developing. It is, it, as Ross said, it is a challenging report because um, the RAC committee purposefully let the user determine what filters, what focus that they wanted to have. So rather than uh, defining that and, and putting at a high risk utilization report, and what Ross is going to go now is this next stage where the filters are already des designed through this committee, which would make it easier. So if you don't want to bother and look at that overall and concentrate on what is defined as high risk, then the same report with different information will be more packaged in a will right. in the next report. So, so a question before you get into your, your reports. For organizations that need to use this, uh, I appreciate the development of reports, but for organizations that just want the raw data so that we can feed information into our own systems that we currently have to analyze this, Will that be made available to us? And again, we're, we're, we're dying like everybody else to get the CMS data and, and see all this. My concern, and I don't know if it's a real concern or not, is somehow Chris will do something to the information that doesn't allow us to pass freely into our systems. And then we have a real nightmare. And again, going back to all the investments we've made in technologies that now we don't have to decouple something that was clean in the first place. So I think there needs to be options available. And one of those options is complete availability of the data to be fed into our systems. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Shule and Donna uh, talk about this a little bit more. But uh, from, from Chris's perspective, you know, when, when we look at our evolution as, a, as an organization, um, much of our everything that we build incrementally we start off with something that's available that you, you know, check into. And for example, on, the, on the, the clinical data that we share in real time, 
we're going from that to single sign-on so that you don't have to log in and go somewhere else, but even further, as part of the integrated care network activity, getting it so that it's integrated into your electronic health records through data feeds. And, and that is our, our perspective. Whenever possible, that's what we would like to do. Um, we are always governed by our governance process. And, uh, and similarly for reporting, you know, we don't have an interest as CRISP in only providing you with static reports. And I will say, if I hear anything from the hospitals, this is the, this is the, quest, the request I hear every day. I was just at MedStar this morning right. and heard something very similar about clinical data from your ambulatory folks. They, they, wanna, they like seeing it, but they right. want to build it in. So, and, it's, and it's certainly not just MedStar. Everybody's asking, you know, especially larger systems that have a lot of you know, data people who want to get their hands on the information. It's, it's about data use and governance, and I will say that you know, this is about as sensitive information as you get in terms of, of the, it's not just your data, it's other data and, and, and all of that. So I think we are stepping into that as guided by our governance process. And as you all become more comfortable with how we do this and as we, you know, our lawyers get comfortable with it and as our funders get comfortable with it, we will do more. And I'd love to hear more about what you guys have to think about that. If there's so, so what, what I hear you saying, Mike, is that we should um, take up a, to evaluate a process similar to the federal government that it does for ATOs right. and focus on uh, rele releasing data for people where there's been a touch with the hospital within the last 24 months or whatever, however we define it, um, mm -hmm. so that that data could be uh, so that the institution could sign an agreement similar to an agreement with the federal government. They could sign that with the right. HSCRC or Absolutely. CRISP or whatever. And so to, to explore that option, um, and I, I don't know what, I, 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 we would have to get the lawyers involved in right, seeing right. exactly what that is. But, um, and we can change the governance structure of CRISP real quick, trust me. <laughs> so, uh, this, uh, but uh, that, that, that uh, seems like what right. you're so asking for. That discussion happened with the PATH report, and hospitals themselves were concerned about the access to this level of information in addition to the consumer. So then there's this policy that the RAC committee and, our, and the CRISP board eventually got involved, outlining the uses, use cases of this information. So I think there is there is a way... Um, to expand the, the data, but it wasn't only us regulators or the CRIS, but the hospitals themselves wanted to make sure that the, the use cases were defined and there wasn't any um, unintentional consequence of such data. And my only point from the CRIS perspective is we, are, we certainly are not trying to create a business model where, where us hoarding data you know, and, and selling you reports out of it, like some of the commercial folks. I mean, we were created as a state-designated entity, as a not-for-profit entity to serve our constituents. And it, we certainly believe that there are instances where raw data is going to be useful, but it is a, it is a governance question and, and a comfort level question and, and the incremental question that we all are, are addressing. And so I, I imagine three years from now we're going to be doing this, you know, differently, and, but, but it's going to be based upon what you decide you want us to do. So again, I, I will find out what the governance structure is at Chris. This is a major issue for the industry. We, we, we spent the first hour talking about how important it is to get data and control uh, of patients. If, if one organization, and truthfully, it's first it slows the, everything down significantly because you have the difficulty of trying to please all these different people in the room. I don't care who you are. It takes time and politics to do that. And generally, we end up going to a standard set that only gets you halfway because you're trying to please so many people. Access to the raw data is critically important. And I, and I mean this sincerely. I know I can move faster than you guys. I, I, I'm positive I can do that. And so these are the things that for, we need to For to your work. needs. I think for, that's your for, point. He for my needs. For my needs. needs. And, and again, we're being asked to get on the hook for all this stuff. So yes, for my needs. I'm fine with you having a menu of opportunities that you can have different views. But my concern is a restriction of the data because of, well, we need to try to help everybody. 
hope everybody by I, 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 I just want to make so sure I think, I'm, I think, I'm I concerned think, about think, govern, think, governance discussion. I, I think before I think I you should think drop governance out of there and start getting your HIPAA lawyers involved and actually looking at all the HIPAA rules and if you want to if you want to put some feet to the fire of how could we do this and make sure thinking about where all the data pieces of the data come from that are in the system mm -hmm. um, what are the HIPAA requirements for that data and how do how could we is there a way that we could make could uh, produce that data in a way that would be HIPAA compliant and and so I think that's that was, that it's was, a legal issue. So it's, I think it's a, it's a legal issue, and and yeah. it's uh, making sure that we are extremely uh, attentive to legal issues relating to HIPAA. And so uh, that's what it is. It's a legal issue. And so I know how Medicare handles their legal issue a little bit, but we have a different way of collecting data, and so we have to look at the way we collect it and understand the legal issues relative to how we're collecting data. So. Mm -hmm. I, if I could have just a brief point that I think uh, chime in with what uh, Ross said. I think the uh, board at CRISP is uh, very keenly aware of this sort of separating from the acquisition and legal issues. I think the question of how much data is packaged versus disseminated uh, is an issue that the board is very well aware of. The board uh, includes representatives from MedStar, uh, Hopkins University, as well as uh, as well as others. But you know the balancing of that. It's not. I don't think the board feels as though it's either one or the other. It's the waiting on this going forward. I think we also, in terms of just sort of the, all the data, you know, just one simple um, issue related to Medicare that we have to keep in mind is that. Uh, you know, uh, today with 42 uh, CFR Part 2 related to substance and drug abuse transactions, you know, we're going to have some, even if CMS gives us all the data, it's either transmitted raw or in part, I think the drug abuse information coming from CMS is very likely to be, you know, limited with outpatient uh, consent and those, that's just one illustration of the types of challenges we'll have to walk through uh, as we go forward with this. And from the, one more thing to think about in addition to the legal issues, there are certain indicators, since I lead the analytics at the shop and spend a lot of time verifying and checking the data, there might be some benefit to wait, wait one or two days so additional information added to that raw data, like the PQIs, readmission flags, other things. So I think as we are discussing it, um, we may want to weigh the benefits of having those do, done by Chris so everybody gets the same measures versus sending it as soon as it comes to the door and then dealing it at the back end to verify those counts and, and getting the same measurement. Uh, well said. Um, just, uh, I, I, and I'll make a comment about that at, a, at one of my last slides. This is a uh, this next report is coming out in about uh, uh, two to three weeks. Um, it is um, it is called the Medicare High Utilizers Report, and Tishalay's point about creating another yet another view of the patient total hospitalization information. This one, um, uh, the the gray line, the gray bar is going across. There's all the redacted information that would be listed here at a patient specific level, but it filters this down to a high utilizer um, cohort of three or more bed admissions in a 12-month period or observation greater than 24-hour, um, uh, then it includes all the things that I've got listed in that, in that table um, are all headers across the top. So at the patient-specific hospital medical record number level, you see which hospitals they've been admitted to um, and then the number of uh, the, which, which hospitals those are, um, the most recent discharge, the most uh, recent, the date of that discharge, the panel affiliations are who is subscribed to this patient for encounter notifications uh, and names those entities and then later you see a count of the number of subscribers to those, to those folks. And then as well as uh, charges and visits um, both at a, a, an aggregate level but also broken out into observation ED versus inpatient uh, and then, and then uh, for your hospital and, and then all hospitals. So a, a large set of information that kind of presents this and again in filterable ways, so you can go down to diagnosis level and, and others. Um, 
So this is coming out again in about three weeks. We've got it uh, near final, and it's going through QA testing right now. Um, we're trying, one of the points to this is we're, we're trying to support the industry as we consider using common language and criteria to coordinate services for complex Medicare beneficiaries. So this kind of gets back to that question of, do you do it yourself and use the raw data versus is there a common way we can talk about this so we can do comparison? And this gets back to our, our, our last slide here, which is, and I hope it builds, so it doesn't build. I'm sorry, I, I, I put a, something on top of this so I could show it, but it's supposed to build up, but I don't think the, the function is, uh, is is supported in this uh, view. Uh, essentially, what this is are the boxes behind the big box um, show um, all of the uh, uh, different core metrics that HSCRC has been working on to report uh, to you. And I'll just uh, I'll just read those off to you uh, for a minute here. There's in, in addition to the total hospitalization costs per capita, there's also one for total hospital discharges per thousand, total healthcare costs, which is in development. Yeah, sorry, I can't move it off the, uh, the screen for you. I'll send you a different version that, that splits it out. Um, ED visits per thousand, readmissions per thousand, potentially avoidable universe, uh, utilization per capita, patient experience, which is in development, uh, a use, in, use of encounter notifications, and we're trying to make sure that, uh, that more and more of your, uh, of your Medicare uh, patients are uh, being, you know, being recognized uh, as on somebody's panel to be given notifications when they're seen in in your facilities. This this particular report is uh, filterable by dates, so you can look at specific dates. And then in the box that's in the middle is kind of the next version of this that we're already working on to show even more granular information and give you a dashboard view that says, okay, for your primary service area, here is what's happening in terms of cost per capita looking at it at a hospital, regional, and statewide level, and then that little cup on the left-hand side with the 70.85% 70 is showing you, you know, what, uh, uh, what part of it is yours versus other, other places. And then the arrows that are colored, forgive me if you are red-green red, uh, colorblind, but it'll, it will tell you, is the up arrow a good thing or a bad thing? Is the down arrow a good thing or a bad thing? So it's not just a, is it up or down, but um, which, which direction is, it, is the one you want it to go in. Um, I think this, this one also is, is the first version is coming out in about three weeks, three to four weeks. Um, and in future versions, what I wanted to emphasize here is we are linking all of these together so that it's easy for you as a, as a high-level administrator looking at the big picture to say, okay, now I need some actionable line, line lead sort of data. And you can go from this total hospital cost per capita and get down into the more granular path reports and eventually into the, into the patient-specific information so you can do things, not just say, oh, well, here's, here's what it is. And you can also do some analysis about, okay, what are the, what are the factors that are influencing this at a, at a more specific level? That's all I have. The last slide is just contact information for, um, for Craig Bem and Paul Cummings on the, on the uh, CRISP Reporting Services team. And again, uh, Mary and, and Craig will be back here next month to go even even more detail. The other thing that um, I think most of you know um, is that Chris does have uh, uh, HSCRC has posted total cost of care broken out by. Uh, bucket um, by county on uh, CRISP. Um, uh, we have asked CRISP to use it to, to move the data off of the server that it's on to a different server so that, um, that people don't have to log in um, to... A secure server. A secure server. To, pardon me? A secure server, right. No, not to a to a to a non-secure server. We want to move it off of a secure server to a non-secure server, so people don't have to log into it. Um, th this is a, just a total cost of care. Uh, so, so we want on a different server. I don't know how sensitive I am to security. Right now. <laughs> I'm very sensitive, but I, I actually want more people to have access to the total cost of care reports, and um, and uh, so so I don't want. Uh, um, Eric from MedStar to have to ask Kathy for a secure access to get into the total cost of care report. So we, we, want, we want them to be more available, not only to the hospitals, but to the nursing homes and the doctors and other folks. So, uh, so 
so that they can start uh, sharing that, uh, the joy of that data um, and uh, I, I, understanding again, it. Again, two-factor authentication to sign in. Um, right sorry, now, was, right now, you have to be authenticated to sign in to look at the total cost of care data. Matt, we'll and, continue and as you. I'll, I'll, address, I'll just address one thing. So, as we've built these things incrementally, generally we've had uh, different sign-ons for everything that we've built. We are working on a unified landing page uh, approach that will have multi-factor authentication, um, and that's we've just done the RFP on that. And what that will do is create role-based access to all our tools and services, so that you are kind of one, you have one relationship uh, with, and your access to different reports. This is talking about the ones that are, you're trying to make more widely available. This is I'll, a I'll very. Have my, I'll have my technical people reach out and talk to you, but uh, I caution, we had the same approach. We wanted more people to have access, and that's one of the reasons we got brought down. No, no, we don't want it on the same server. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'll just have my tech help. We don't need to do it today. Yeah. we. Well, we, we can put it somewhere else than CRISP if we can't um, get the right uh, the right uh, access. So we're trying to make it more accessible. I need a holiday, don't I? Yes. I definitely need no, I, Me too. Me too. We all do. Um, so we wanted to um, wanted to go back and just talk about um, getting um, new. Uh, we're talking about these are hospital dashboards, but also starting to focus on some new dashboards for the commission and the state to be looking at that are more aspirational um, and and also that are providing some additional information. And um, and we're also um, we've been putting out a lot of information on all payer data in the public meeting, but we're moving toward putting Medicare specific data out from our Medicare performance monitoring and um, and and trying to um, make sure that um, that uh, folks appreciate the, um, the 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 Medicare performance measures and. Um, um, and where we stand, we um, and we put this uh, information that you have a little packet called hospital and total cost of care spending for beneficiary, and um, this is uh, Medicare information, and we get information by every month um, on from uh, Medicare to monitor our performance, and um, and. And, and so we have a, a couple of graphics that we do every month to um, look at, at where we are. And um, and, and so the um, the first graphic behind the disclaimer, as we always have the disclaimer, that's uh, not uh, not official data. It's got projections in it. It's not audited, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so um, we've got. Um, uh, four uh, four graphics in here, and um, we'll probably have a couple more that we're adding to the commission packet. But we're uh, going to be producing this sort of information for the commission public commission meetings um, of looking at where Maryland's spending per Medicare beneficiary is headed on a month by month basis um, versus the the same month in the um, in the 12, 12 months ago, so it's a year-over-year -year, uh, trend report, Maryland versus national. And so, just for example, as you can, as you look at the hospital spending per Medicare beneficiary, uh, we have three years worth of data here, or two years uh, worth of data. I'm sorry, 14 and 15 in the beginning of 16, um, and um, what you will see in 14. Is that for most of the year, um, the hospital spending per beneficiary was growth was below the national average. Um, as we get into 15, um, for it was a mixed uh, a mixed result, and we uh, and so in 14 we ended up the year well below the national average on the spending trend. In 15, part of the time we're above, and part of the time we're below. And in 15, we ended up uh, one tenth of one percent under the national spending trend for 15. Um, uh, so well under in 14, 
one tenth of one percent under in 15, and in 16, and, and so that one tenth of one percent, um, um, you know, that spread um, kind of hurt us on on uh, uh, on uh, uh, the um, uh, the comparisons. And now, as we get to 16, um, we are uh, we, we we've got uh, we we had a great snowstorm in January and no flu, which is awesome. Um, good way to start the year. Way to go, guys. Um, the uh, and and on the hospital side, we're still staying below. We have April data now, and we're still below in April. So. Um, on the hospital side, way to go. Um, um, but now we get to the total cost of care graphic. And um, uh, how far below are we this year so far? I know it's projected. On the hospital numbers, we are um, uh, year to date, we're $50 million lower. Um, and on the and on the non-hospital side, we're $25 million above, and, the, and we'll see what that could could mean. So the you know the, the issue is, is the uh, the good performance on the hospital side one time, and what happens if the non-hospital side continues to grow? Does it eclipse the hospital performance that was contributed to heavily in January? And so we just want to make sure that we're Going through these and understanding what they're showing us, and so now we look at. But on the hospital side, we're under for all four months. On the hospital side. Yeah. Yeah. So you see that on this graph, right? So we want you to see every month what's going on on the hospital side. So far this year, we're under. Now for the total cost of care. Um, Looking back to um, 14, and basically um, Maryland is uh, again mostly under uh, almost every month on total cost of care growth for 14. Um, heavily driven by the hospital side, but you'll see on the next graph that the non-hospital side was also under. Uh, consistently the whole time for 14. Um, and we'll get there in a second. For 15, um, what you see is that the that the total cost of care was over almost every month um, in Maryland versus the national data, and that ended us up being seven tenths of a percent over for the year on total cost of care. And we'll see in a minute what the non-hospital spending is doing, and then. Now we're looking at the current year, January through March, and I have April figures now, which will be added to this graph shortly, um, and we'll start sharing them even more. Um, so basically, we can see that we're down in January, but not quite as much as we're down on the hospital. But by the time we get to February and March, we're actually above on total cost of care in the state. So what's driving that? So let's look on the next page. So you can see in 14, um, the non-hospital spending growth is below the national average. Um, we hit 15 in Every single, you know, pretty much every single month, it uh, goes above the national average for non-hospital spending. The non-hospital spending growth above the national average is half of it is post-acute care, and the other half of it is Part B. Um, but and um, and so then um, now we get, and so I thought, well, maybe. When we get to 16, since it was already high in 15, it won't. And we're measuring 16 over 15. Maybe it's not. It's going to flatten out, and we're not going to continue to see excess growth. But so far, um, with the exception of January, where it's uh, it's uh, it's down, um, 
nobody could get to anywhere except for the snow. Um, back to February, March, and again in April, um, the non-hospital cost growth is trending above the national spending rate. Um, and the a lot of the uh, non-hospital spending growth is in, in this particular period is in the Part B side and uh, not as much in the post-acute. The post-acute was suppressed because when the patients didn't get to the hospital in January, they didn't get to the uh, nursing homes either. Um, so, um, so we'll have to see whether that picks back up. But obviously, this is a concern um, and um, we're very worried about this in terms of, of uh, the total cost of care for the year. And, um, and we have these requirements where we can't exceed the total cost of care growth by more than zero or we have the potential or we have the uh, path toward a corrective action plan, not, not to speak of the concerns about having a negotiation on the extension of our uh, 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 our model to take on total cost of care after we would have an excess growth. So I, I just want you to see the dynamics of this and um, what it means in terms of the, the sensitivity of what's going on with the data and the importance of looking at leading indicators, not just uh, year-to-date averages. Because if you look at year-to-date averages, you're going to be fooled into complacency um, but all of a sudden, if we have one line accelerating and the other line leveling off, um, we are going to we could easily end up in a in a bad spot. Um, I have uh, two two quick questions. Um, one is uh, I noticed that in the um, in the hospital and total graphs, you have a dotted line indicating projections. Uh, for recent months, and in the non-hospital, there's a it's solid through March. Is that just, I mean... That's an error in graphing. Error. It's, it's just hey, it's get that so, fixed. So the, <laughs> the second question is, the second question is, I, I mean, you know... Sorry about I, that. I, I, I surmise it's, it's, a, new, it's a new graph. The second question is, uh, what's our past experience with uh, uh, how the projections relate to the final numbers that come in? Yeah, are they usually pretty on target? They've, they've been pretty good. We've been measuring them now. Um, so we have completion factors that we use, and in, in, um, and so the completion factors have been pretty good. We had one blip right after ICD-10. Um, we were a little worried about uh, the, a potential blip after MedStar's uh, system issues, but it, that didn't actually end up being a problem with the numbers here. But um, um, yeah. So, um, so they've been pretty pretty good. Yeah. Donna, just where, where, where was April for um, total spend? Was it in aggregate under or over? Uh, it's over, over. Uh, it's over a little bit. So we've had three months we're over now. Mm -hmm. And just a point on as we look at this data. You know, you talked about the, the leading indicators, and I think that's appropriate to, to continue looking at the trend. You know, one thing just to take a step back and think about, you know, the hospital, you know, versus the, the non-hospital spending. Um, you know, we, have, we haven't placed an absolute value. Um, you don't see that as to, to what the spending is on, on these trends. Because when we just had the conversation and we all sort of, you know, violently agreed that we had to have aspirational goals to reduce, you know, the expensive hospital utilization and do better care coordination um, with lots of different investments. We would certainly, I think, expect some of the non-hospital spending to grow to the extent that we accelerate that model faster than the rest of the country through, you know, use of, um, you know, additional physician services with the goal of keeping folks out of the hospital and reducing the more expensive hospital utilization. So I think as we look at this, you know, I just want to make the point that's always one of those things to keep in mind, that the goal is to reduce the line on page three, which is the hospital line, because that's the most expensive 
you know, course of care. And to the extent we do things outside of the hospital to keep folks out of the hospital, we would potentially expect to see the line on page five, you know, be slightly higher. I think that the trend may be higher than it needs to be, but just keep that in mind as we think about the, the absolute value. Of that I, I absolutely don't want to distract anybody from the hospital line because that is the number one line for avoidable utilization is the hospital line, but the hospital line decrease needs to be bigger than the right. non-hospital line increase and to the tune of a half a percent of hospital costs, because that's what our target is, is to keep under the national growth rate by at least a half a percent. That's what our target is uh, based on. Um, and so that's the spread that we would like. And I think a half a percent on the hospital is like a 0.3 percent under on total cost of care, more or less. Um, so, you know, we'd like to be growing uh, we, we need to be growing underneath the total cost of care in order to have to show Medicare that we're getting our utilization down um, faster than we're putting money into the non-hospital side. So right. those are part of the dynamics that and we don't want to distract anybody from reducing avoidable utilization um, in the hospital to think, oh my God, I got to think about uh, XYZ doctor's office. What we're saying is when you set those benchmarks for your hospital, you need to set them low enough, your, your targets high enough, aspirational enough to make up for the extra money that you're going to spend in the non-hospital side. And um, if you're going to use more home care, which you should be, and you're going to use more hospice care, which you should be, then you should be expecting to get your hospital utilization down enough to cover that cost on the non-hospital side. So don't get distracted thinking that you need to reduce hospice care because that's not the message. The message is, hey, we got to really keep our eye on this and put our foot on the gas pedal on the hospital utilization gas pedal to get it down. Um, um, this, this, is, this is stand on. It seems to me there's another point here, which is um, if we're looking at non-hospital costs going up because we're investing in the community and um, in doing so for the purpose of achieving greater reductions in hospital costs. That's terrific. If, uh, but on the other hand, if, if the costs are going up outside the hospital for other reasons, well, that's a different story. And the worst case scenario would be we are achieving our hospital savings by shifting costs inappropriately to non-hospital settings. And so one of the important values of this um, inclusion of non-hospital care costs as a focus is that would enable us to hopefully check any, any inappropriate shifting of costs from the hospital to the non-hospital setting. And I, 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 I wouldn't say it's inappropriate, it's just that I want to take down your GBR budget if you shift it and you need to, you have a notification requirement and I, I need to take down your budget if you are moving it out of the hospital. So it's not inappropriate, it's just uh, we need a budget reduction. Um, and um, and I do think there are two areas outside of the hospital that at least um, at, at least uh, that, that I have an eye on. One is the uh, SNF, and um, I think some folks have been putting patients in SNF, and they didn't realize they were staying for 30 days after they got put there. And so y'all have to uh, tackle that issue and make agreements with your SNF not to keep them for 30 days. Um, but to, to have agreements with them if you're going to put them there instead of uh, keeping them another day or two in the hospital and sending them to home health, you need to tackle that issue. And I know the hospital association is working on that. The other thing that I saw in the data um, that needs a little bit more work um, and um, is, is the uh, non-hospital drug costs. Um, and um, they, they went up uh, a lot. And um, we need to see if some of that money shifted out of the hospitals. And if it did, we need to take it out of the GBR budgets. But, um, but in any event, we th those are just just a couple of things that that you know that are uh, noticeable. Um, but um, you know, everybody should really be thinking about their GBR requirements because if we are paying for something outside of the hospital that we set up in the GBR budget in the hospital. Well, that's kind of like 
double billing. <laughs> so uh, something that you should be seriously concerned about um, if uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot and thinking that we're uh, doing a good job of maximizing revenue is going to be shooting ourselves in the foot. Donna, just a quick clarification. Sorry, you just mentioned outpatient drug costs. Are you talking about the like the oncology, you know, that type of non, is it, as opposed to Part D, because that's excluded, right? I'm talking about Part B, Part B. which is uh, non, non, this is for non-hospital Part B drug costs, um, had a very uh, big, had a very big increase in the data. It, it could be cancer, it could be um, uh, medications used for um, rheumatoid arthritis or, uh, pardon me? I don't think Hep C is a Part B drug. I think it's a Part D drug. Okay. Sorry. But Donna, can you tease out the ASC portion of the non-hospital? Yes, it's, it's teased out, and, and this is the Medicare data. This isn't the commercial data, but it is teased out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and so um, we we actually would be wanting, you know, if you all want to look at the same files, the five-year trend files, we would be happy to make sure that you they're made available to you too. So. Okay. Don, I, um, let me. I, I would just point out, uh, you know, on the on the part B drugs, that's been a problem nationwide. So, if I, I don't know what extent that's that's driving the difference between Maryland and the rest of the nation, but if it is, you know, we might want to look at that. In fact, we may want to focus on the components of that Maryland versus nationwide. Let's not confuse level with comparative. Exactly. Trends. And so we, it, we're, it may be the same cost increase as nationally, and if it is, that's great, but it did stick out because it was such a high percentage increase. And, um, and uh, there, Believe it or not, there may be some opportunities to have lower cost drugs at 340B prices in hospitals. And uh, it's, we, we want to make sure that we don't uh, uh, shift stuff out into non-hospital settings that are at higher price points than hospital settings. Okay. And 340B is very uh, favorable pricing for some of these new expensive drugs. And to Stan's point, when, when or to Stan's, to Stu's point, when we, um, you know, when we've looked at this, just given what CMMI has, the data has provided, you know, HSC or C staff, and then you've shared with us, again, I think, you know, we, we have been looking at the breakdowns for Maryland, but Maryland only. Um, you know, we do have, they've given us the national data, but it's been, you know, on a much more lagged annual basis. So, again, just another point to go back to CMS as we think about this, because the comparative and the relative change is very important. Um, as opposed to just looking at one side of the ledger. Right. And um, um, not to bog in, down into details, but we are actually deregulating the uh, oncology service at, um, at Frederick um, because they are building a new oncology center off campus at uh, much less cost and they don't have 340B prices. So we are actually deregulating those, but we're taking them out of the GBR. Um, and we're going to measure to make sure that there's no no cost to savings associated with it. Um, so we're expecting to see cost savings and not just savings. Um, last slide. Oh, actually, I don't. We yeah, we did look at the non-hospital slide. Um, the last slide here is the county level, and this is just the high. This is just the total cost of care spending by county for 15 versus 14, um, and so the national growth was 1.7, the Maryland growth was 2.5, and this shows what happened in each county. And underneath this is um, the report that's posted on CRISP that we probably need to get somewhere else so folks can drill down and, and other folks can drill down and see what by bucket is going on. Um, and I guess one of the things that I want you to just think about is, so last year we had a 2.5% total cost of care growth in the state, and Medicare's uh, actuarial estimates for this year, um, the ones that they released in January that we used for the rate update for total cost of care growth for 16 is 1.1% growth. 
Um, the president's, I mean, the um, trustees report came out, just came out, and they actually lowered them. And so um, uh, the um, so it, I, I guess all of this is to say we're really this commission staff is really nervous about the non-hospital growth and the hospital utilization declines because uh, we, we, we know that we have to hit something that is uh, lower than the federal growth rate, and the federal growth rate is lower than last year. Well, and um, um, the federal growth rate estimate is lower than last year, and, um, and we were at 2.5, and we need to be um, lower than the federal growth rate. Um, Donna, can I make two points on this, please? Yes. One is, to, to that point, I mean, it, that, that both of those are true as far as the estimates, but the current actual year-to-date national, the total cost of care growth rate is 1.65%, so the... It's down already. It, it is they down, but it, it is above, I mean, we're talking, it is above both estimates. Just wanted to make that point. Second point is, to the extent we're looking at the leading edge and, you know, you want a geographic focus here, we ha we do have this data, it's been 11 through 15, to the extent we can get 16 year-to-date information to look at this by county so we can focus, because if we need to be focused on the leading edge efforts, then that's where we need to go. Average age of the Medicare recipient groups in the county, income levels, something like that. Before, before we move, we have the best practice. We want to know that it's yeah, there, there are some other additional tabs in that total cost report looking at the prevalence of chronic conditions by county, Medicaid enrollment. Um, we could see if we can add additional. Is it the risk adjustment? No, no, just like at the county level, percent of people with hypertension, percent of people diabetes. Yeah. Why, why don't, why don't, could, could you all, in the end, why not you all work with us to come up with a list of what we would like to do to move it forward. So um, that, that would be really good. Um, and and um, um, MHA is working with us on this. We have also, um, we have also, we have a con uh, vendor, a triple S, who produces reports. We have also, um, uh, ask Chris to drive through reports to the hospitals. We have two consultants working with Chris to drive these reports out to you as fast as possible. Um, and um, uh, Eric Lindemann, I, some of you have met Eric, um, who's been, he's been at a number of the hospital association meetings, who's a, a very good expert with the Medicare data. And um, in, uh, KPMG has seats on our data warehouse, and they're going to help push out the reports in the short term. In the longer term, we're hoping that you have access directly to the data, and we're going to get into that discussion here in just a minute. But um, we are planning to start pushing the data out, so as you start to get the data and you want more information out of the data, we have restrictions on what we can push out. It can't be cell size less than 10. And, um, um, and, and so we're going to push out as much data as we can, as fast as we can, so that you can uh, understand it. MHA has been working on the, um, on the nursing home side of pushing out the post-acute data, and, um, and so we're uh, trying to stay really focused so that we only spend money once and we're not duplicating resources. Um, questions, comments, so I guess um, Michelle just left the room. She said she was having a very happy beginning of summer, and I said, well, maybe she'd be a little more nervous after we got through seeing some of these graphs, and I always like to share my nervousness with, uh, with, with other, everybody else, um, so we're uh, obviously a little nervous about this more than a little nervous, and um, we have to see, you know, where we are, you know, next month and the uh, month after, and 
um, be extremely cautious. But also, we, we need you guys to be really aggressive with your implementation while we're being cautious and watching the data and communicating a lot about it um, in, in the event that we're uh, needing to make a, a quick move. So I guess on to our next topic. And uh, let's oh, so we are check our, are we out, of out of time. Um, so maybe if we have two quick things to up, give updates and then take up in the next meeting. OK. Do you want to talk about the Medicare data? The, um, I, I think ne next um, Friday on the 8th, um, we're um, having a meeting with MHA to talk about the amendment to the all-payer model, which is a vehicle to get identifiable Medicare data. We also now have a vehicle to get a full limited data set that's up to date that is not identifiable but can be used to monitor um, what's going on with total cost of care. It has provider information in it. It's got linked information, but it's not identifiable. And so um, we may uh, uh, end up getting uh, into that at the um, uh, next week. Uh, we'll be starting to accelerate that process, but we want you to know that it's going to come fast, hopefully. We hope that the data will come fast from CMS. They're promising that they'll try to get it to us quickly for the limited data set. The identifiable data set we'll talk about next week, but it would come through the amendment um, to our GBR, or to our uh, uh, all-payer model agreement. The um, we will be putting out a contract addendum for the GBR agreement relative to the update process, and um, that will uh, institute overcharge penalties for the mid-year target since we have a separation between the first and second half of the year. Um, we also have had some issues with some large uh, rate changes on unit rates and um, uh, on an interim basis, and so we're we're focused on putting a limit on how much the charge uh, increases or decreases should be on an interim basis, and putting a 10% limit on that without permission. And um, unless you all have a better idea, um, I the, just a the mid year. That's just that's not unit rates, right? The the mid year is a is the GBR. Target, but not you. That's not a that's not a unit rate quarter. But we are wanting to put a unit rate quarter on in general. Yeah, I, and I was my only comment on this. Under, and we completely understand the 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 need for compliance on the mid year GBR target. Obviously, that was a decision, and and you know we need to to live with that. And we need to make that work. Um, I don't think this is the right place or time to have this discussion, but I think. We probably need to have a thorough discussion on unit rate compliance under GBR and and what that means from both a philosophical standpoint and then from also a tactical standpoint because I do think that there's a lot of time and effort and energy going into um, those things that have been a hallmark of the system for many many years but I think there can potentially be some simplification of that um, so we can go back to you know what we spent the majority of this meeting talking about, and that was focusing, um, you know, efforts and um, to, to reduce potentially avoidable utilization, use different reports and other things. I just think we need to revisit that whole conversation. Right. We but we we want to. Um, and, and anybody who has contacted us about their rate compliance, we tell everybody don't up and down your rates more than 10 percent to get in compliance. We'll give you a waiver. Um, you know. We don't want you to be jerking your rates around too much, and so I think that's that's the conversation that we're trying to say. Hey, we saw some people taking their rates up or down 20 percent. We don't want that. We really want to keep them more stable, and so that's uh, we'll give you a waiver on an individual rate center um, to keep you from, you know, bumping it up and down too much. Um, that uh, that was that topic.
and actually the conditions that are on these uh, sheets that we're looking at and also the electronic health record condition that we want to put in there to get our hopefully get our model qualified as an alternative payment model. Um, did we, we're, we are out of time. What else are we going to try to accomplish today? So just quickly, I think on the market shift, based on the, the discussions we had, um, staff is planning to do mid-year market shift adjustments using the six-month data and then reconciling it to the 12th month at the end of the fiscal year. Um, we can kind of discuss the details through the MHA technical work group, um, and then we'll be looking at you know other PAU definitions. Um, and um, I received very thoughtful comments in terms of this inpatient and outpatient trend. Uh, maybe this year is now that we have the main measure to look at some of those shifts and then try to get them in the same service line so hospitals are protected from inpatient outpatient shifts. Um, so that will be the focus uh, for us in the coming months. And, and so while we're putting sepsis in the PAU category for market shift, it's not a proposal for um, the uh, PAU adjustment yet. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but no, we want people to fix their coding because we think there's some bad coding problems. And when they fix it, we don't want it to potentially show up as a, a PAU ad, uh, or, you know, as a market shift adjustment. Hey, Shalee, real quick, are you worried with a six month, I know we have some areas where we have small cell issues in the market shift calculation. Mm -hmm. With the six months, are you worried that that will yeah. mess yeah. with the calculation? Yeah, I think <laughs> I'm always worried about that. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at, I'll, maybe I'll run the historical data six okay. months and then see what, what it shows. Okay. That's a good idea. But we are settling up at, at a 12 month level at the end. Oh, I understand. I just, I have no idea what kind of what that might create. It did, I mean, like, since we are doing cumulatively, my recollection, it didn't change too much from the six-month data versus what we did with the 12th month. Okay. Uh, but there are some service lines, like ventilator support, that we were concerned there might be some aggregation needed if you're really going to do six months. Yeah. On uh, the last agenda item, just real quickly, the announcement that the July 13th meeting has been canceled or the commission meeting. However, we want to keep things moving and we want to honor the comment, public comment periods that we have. So what we intend to do, like with the, the uh, psychiatric uh, hospital and uh, Mount Washington uh, pediatric recommendation, uh, before the what was going to be the July meeting date, we plan to get that out on our website for public comment. So we'll notify you that it's out. So please, we'll, we'll give you the period of time that you have. Please if, feel free to provide comment. Or of course, uh, in August, when we plan to go final on that, you always have the opportunity to testify as well. The other item that we'll, we'll do the same thing with are the, the um, uh, work for, uh, population health workforce for disadvantaged areas. Uh, recommendation. They were the applications that we uh, asked for. We received three. Um, the review committee is uh, uh, working on that and, and actually there's some back and forth questions from the, uh, the review committee. So we intend somewhere around July 13th period to have a recommendation on our website available. Again, we'll let you know about that. Feel free to you know provide comment and we intend to take that up with the commission in final form at the August meeting. Uh, we'll also, uh, you know, publish uh, the monitoring Maryland performance numbers, which everybody, you know, has interest in looking at. So we can keep things moving. Want you all to be looking at trends, including some new Medicare uh, supplements in the monitoring Medicare uh, monitoring Maryland performance. So. Right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and uh, um, thank you for uh, bearing down on avoidable Medicare utilization. <laughs>